Old Testament, so we're in Ezekiel 15 and 16 tonight. Hope you have your Bibles and we can open up to that. Um, And as you do, let's pray. Lord, what a joy it is every time we have the opportunity to dig into your word. Lord, thank you for the truth that is there. And thank you, Lord, for showing us Jesus throughout. The entirety of the book, Lord, is about our Lord Jesus Christ and his love and his grace. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us see that again tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think the best gifts are the unexpected ones. The treasured gifts are the undeserved ones. We uh, enjoy, at least I do, the presents we get at Christmas and birthdays and that sort of thing. But, you know, we, although we, it's impolite to say so, we kind of expect those things, right? We give them, we receive them. It's the ones that we don't expect, you know, those are the ones that we really treasure. Those are the ones that we remember. When it's completely unmerited and comes out of the blue, That's when I think it leaves the greatest impact, and I think that's the way it should be. And that's, of course, how God gives his gifts of grace, completely unmerited. And, of course, we know one definition of grace itself is unmerited favor. And so it comes out of nowhere. It comes from the love of God, not because we deserved it. That's the salvation, of course, we have through Jesus Christ. Um, That's a relationship we have with God, totally unmerited, all because of his work through Jesus', as we just sang, the death of the cross and the resurrection. Those are things we did not expect. We should not have expected. Those are things we did not definitely deserve. What we deserved, as we know, punishment, damnation because of our sin. What we receive, mercy, love, life, and Jesus. That sort of thing leaves an impact. And by the way, that's why we leave our sins behind. We don't leave our sins behind because we've somehow been able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and uh, you know, clean up our own act. No, we do so because we've already been cleansed by Jesus. And so, as we were saying last week, now we want to live rightly in a way that's pleasing to him. It's nothing that we're uh, we're forced to do in order to please God and enter heaven. No, it's something we get to do because heaven has already been promised and accomplished for us. But in order for us to rejoice over that free gift of grace, we've got to become acquainted with the reason that it's undeserved in the first place. We cannot appreciate forgiveness if we're never aware of the judgment that we faced and so like any criminal would have to stand and have the charges read to him in a court of law we have to understand the severity of our sin and that's what God does through Ezekiel for the Jews of Jerusalem in chapters 15 and 16. Now he does promise very much so grace and forgiveness but what we're going to find is God spends far more time detailing their sin against him. Why? Well, because that way they would understand their need. They needed to see how lost they were if they're ever to understand how great the gift of God was for them. They needed to see that God's love for them was totally undeserved if they were to appreciate it for what it was. They had given God no reason to save them, but they, you know, they received a salvation anyway. Likewise, of course, we give God no reason at all to save us, but he does it anyway. That's how much he loves you and me. And so we start off with chapter 15, is Jerusalem as the, uh, the dead vine, starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any other wood? The vine branch was among the trees of the forest. Is wood taken from it to make any object? Or can men make a peg from it to hang any vessel on? Indeed, it's thrown into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it, and its middle is burned. Is it useful for any work? Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it. How much less will it be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? And we're going to find that chapter 15 is is short by any standard, and it's uh, absolutely tiny when we compare it with the following chapter, chapter 16. It's very brief, but it makes a very important analogy and an important point. Jerusalem, as we'll see in the next verse, is compared to this grapevine, Now, that itself is not unusual at all. That's a very common metaphor. The prophet Isaiah uh, referred to Judah as a vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5. Jesus, later on, is going to, uh, of course, condemn the Pharisees and the scribes as being rebellious vineyard workers in the same vineyard of Israel. Read about that in Matthew 21. What makes this slightly different is that, uh, you know, 
in the other metaphors, the, the nation is an entire vineyard. The vineyard is alive. It's producing, even though it may not be producing what the Lord desires for it to produce. Uh, obviously, you know, in Isaiah 5, he talks about it producing wild grapes. But to Ezekiel, the city of Jerusalem, which does likely extend to the entire nation of Israel or Judah, this city is a single vine, and the vine is dead. And at this point, it's just a piece of wood. And so God asks Ezekiel, what good can come from a dried-up grapevine? Can it be made into a piece of furniture? No. Can it be fashioned into anything useful? Well, no. The one thing a grapevine is good for is grape production. But when that has ceased, so has the usefulness of the vine. Afterwards, it's just a twisted, thin, ugly piece of wood. And at that point, the only use it has is fuel for the fires, turned into ash, of course, burned, discarded. Now that's bad enough for a plant. It's worse when the plant represents God's people. Look at verse 6. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. They will go out from one fire, but another fire shall devour them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, when I set my face against them, thus I will make the land desolate, because they have persisted in unfaithfulness, says the Lord God. And the point here is that the Jerusalem Jews didn't leave God any options. He cared for them as a vineyard, but they turned into a dead, fruitless vine. And so what could God do with them other than to judge them? That's the only option that remains. God promised, he says here, to set his face against them, to use them as fuel for the fire of his judgment. And they'd go from one fire to the next, to the point that they're completely devoured. And, of course, that's exactly what happened when, of course, they uh, endured attack after attack at Babylon. Finally, we got this last third Babylonian siege of Jerusalem um, with the armies of Nebuchadnezzar. The sovereignty of Jerusalem is finally stripped away. That's what's being referred to here. But what would happen at that point? Well, at that point, finally they would know the Lord as their God. When? He says, when I set my face against them. When God judged them. When they endured their suffering. Only then would they understand the scope of their sin. They'd understand the reality of God's judgment against them. God's faithfulness to his covenant discipline would testify of the Jews' faithlessness, their persistent unfaithfulness, against God that would be brought to their knees, and that would be the thing that would humble their hearts, cause them to seek the Lord. So, can God use our sin to bring us to repentance? Well, without question. We have, obviously, free will to sin against God as much as we desire to do, but that doesn't mean that God's going to remain silent in the process. He's going to chasten us like a father, and sometimes he chastens us severely, and it's often... The, the very chastening that God brings is what brings us to that point of humility and repentance. Now, obviously, we don't have to let it get to that point, but God will do it if it's necessary. There is, by the way, good news for Israel here, even in the midst of God's promise of judgment. Would the nation be devoured? Yes, it would be burned. But they would not be utterly wiped from the face of the earth. The land would become desolate, as he says here, but we know it would only be for time. Why? Because there's other promises of God that the land would once become inhabited again. It would be fruitful again. We read that in chapter 11, verses 17 through 20. So was the nation a dead, fruitless vine? Yes, it was. But God, as we know, is in the business of resurrection. He can make dead things come to life again, even dead vines, dead nations, and obviously dead people. That's exactly the promise that we have in Christ Jesus. In our sins, we are dead. We have nothing to offer God except what? Rebellion. And because of it, we're all dead men, dead women walking. We face a sentence of eternal death because of the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But in Christ, we have new life. We're made into new creations with a new future. No longer are we dried up and we're dead, fit for nothing but fire. Now we're the children of God, bearing holy fruit to his glory, that is grace. And of course, that's the wonder of his work among us. So that's the parable of the vine. He's going to go on to another parable of Jerusalem as a harlot in chapter 16. 
Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abomination. Stop there. Chapter 16 is going to be a very long one, <laughs> but it's long for a reason. God told Ezekiel here to educate the Jerusalem Jews on their abominations towards him. And those abominations were extensive. Now, just like chapter 15, it relies on an extended metaphor, and this is one that's extremely fitting, harlotry, prostitution. God frequently, as we'll see later on, compares idolatry to harlotry and that the worship of false gods is much like soliciting multiple sexual partners rather than enjoying the safety and joy of a single relationship with the true God. And the history of God's people is one that's filled with idolatry and they showed themselves uh, as to be really a harlot among harlots. And that's going to take some time for God to describe it all. Again, it brings out the point we need to be aware of our sins if we're able to turn from them, if we're ever going to turn from them in repentance. You know, we don't like thinking upon our sins for obvious reasons. We'd much rather have, you know, a quick prayer of forgiveness and go on our way as if nothing ever happened. But that's ignoring the problem rather than dealing with it. Praise God, he offers true forgiveness, he offers true healing. And yes, he calls us to, to move on from the things of the past, not dwell on those things. But at the same time, if we never deal with the root problem, we're going to end up going right back to it again, like a dog returning to its vomit. That's why David, among other things, you know, asked God to search his own heart to see if there was any wicked way in him. That's why he was asking God to judge his enemies, by the way, Psalm 139. Uh, but still, he wanted to see if there was anything in him that needed judgment. And we need to do the same thing. We need to examine our sins honestly as we turn from them to God. And that's really what confession, true confession is all about, is agreeing with God that our sins are sinful. But we got to know what it is if we're to confess it at all, right? It's a difficult thing to ask God to examine our hearts. It's very difficult because it's humbling, but it's a needful thing if we're ever to move forward in healing and move forward in newness of life. Now, regarding this parable or this allegory itself, please note that this is to Jerusalem. What God's going to describe to Ezekiel is a very you know, symbolic history of the city itself. And the city stands in place for the people. The city stands in place for the nation of the whole. It's like, you know, we refer to Washington, D.C., and we're referring to really the United States as a whole, even if you're speaking about various aspects of the city itself. So a similar thing's going to be seen here as God introduces the origin of Jerusalem as being Gentile. Look at verse 3. And say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped with swaddling cloths. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you, were, you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. Now, remember that when God first formed the nation of the Hebrews, he did so outside of the promised land. Jacob had a, quite a large clan that went down into Egypt, but it numbered 70 people at that. And it wasn't until they were in Egypt that they grew into this numerous nation, and God took them from the place of Egypt to the land of Canaan. Now, there were already cities in the land of Canaan. Jebus, or Jerusalem, which it later became known, was already there. And so this was a city founded by Gentiles originally, and it remained, by the way, unclaimed by the Hebrews all the way through the time of the judges, all the way through the time of King Saul. It remained claimed by the Gentiles all the way until David, 1 Chronicles 11. His army conquered the city, and he claimed it as his capital. The point, though, here is that Jerusalem had an ignoble beginning, right? It was founded by the pagans of the land. It was basically rejected by them without any of the even most basic love and care given to it. And God describes it like a baby that's abandoned by ancient parents to die of exposure in the wilderness. That's the way Jerusalem was when God brought his people to it. That's when God intervened. Look at verse 6. And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. And I made you thrive like a plant in the field. And you grew and mature and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was the time of love. And so I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. How did Jerusalem go from the backwater city of 
uh, Jebus to the mighty nation's capital, Jerusalem, the capital of the kingdom of Israel, respected and even at sometimes a feared city among the nations of the world. Well, it was all by the grace of God. God saw the struggling city. He had compassion towards it. He spoke life to it. And as it matured, it thrived. God took it to himself as a husband would take a bride. You know, he married this city because he designated the city as the city of his own temple. That was the place where his presence dwelt. So this is the very picture of grace. This is also what could be so easily spoken of each one of us as born-again Christians, right? Because we're part of the bride of Christ. We had our own pagan background with no covenant tie between us and God. We were the rejected ones. We were wallowing in our sin, awaiting our death until Jesus showed up. And he called us out of our sin. He called us to himself. He spoke life to us by his word, and he brought us into an everlasting covenant relationship with him. We once were nothing. We had nothing. But the work of Jesus did something truly amazing. Peter actually describes it in his epistle when he says in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. I love that verse because it speaks of what we were before Jesus. We were nothing. We were nothing, and we had zero claim to God at all. Then Jesus called out to us, and he made us everything that we are now. So we know what we were. Now we can truly rejoice in what we are. That is due to amazing grace. We never want to forget where we came from. You know, this is part of the point that God's making with Jerusalem. They forgot who they were. They especially forgot what God had done for them. And that's the reason they went so far into sin. And the less that we remember the immensity of God's grace towards us, the greater our propensity is to sin against him. So we want to be ever amazed at his grace, his calling, and his love towards us. And God goes on to describe these blessings he poured out on the city, starting in verse 9. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood. I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was on fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. So God cleansed the city from what it was. He beautified it. He loved the city. He treated it as a king would treat his favored queen. She was beautiful. She was lacking nothing. Verse 14, your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty. For it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed upon you, says the Lord God. And how true this was, especially during the reigns of David and Solomon. Remember the descriptions of the nation during that time, that silver and gold flowed freely into the city, and people came from all over the Middle East to see the riches of Jerusalem, to be astounded by the wisdom of Solomon. Ultimately, God says this is all his splendor. It's not really the city's. It's God's splendor. These are his gifts. This is his blessing. Jerusalem prospered because God desired that it would. Yet this prosperity would not last. Although the Jerusalem reached the height of its glory during the reign of Solomon. Remember that it was during those very days that they started their downfall. Because as Solomon's eyes became entranced by foreign women, his heart became entranced by foreign gods. And so began this long descent of Jerusalem into idolatry. So they started off in a place of utter rejection, but they were brought to this place of immense holiness and beautifying and the glory of God now this description goes into this long downfall. Verse 15, But you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. You took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. You have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourselves male images and played the harlot with them. You took your embroidered garments and covered them, and you set my oil and my incense before them. Also my food, which I gave you, the pastry of fine oil, flour, and honey, which I fed you, you set it before them as sweet incense. And so it was, says the Lord God. 
Jerusalem was the city of God. It had God's own temple within it. And its kings and its citizens were given over into idolatry. They were enamored with their own wealth. And then they put their trust in the gifts rather than the giver. And their hearts turned from God. They began to worship the false gods of the nations that surrounded them. And the Lord graphically depicts the spiritual whoredom of Jerusalem as a city that's using you know, gold statues as sexual items. It's terrible. All the blessings that have been given them by God were perverted by the people and committing spiritual adultery against him. God had blessed them with gold and silver and food and oil. Instead of it being dedicated to him in worship, it was given over to the false gods of their neighbors. And as we often have to remind ourselves, please keep in mind, we don't need a statue in order to engage in idolatry. We do the same thing when we take God's gifts and use them for our own lusts or our own false worship. Instead of blessing God with our income and the things that he gives us, we give it over to the idol of whatever, of entertainment. Instead of devoting our time to worship Jesus, we give him the leftovers if we give him even that. Now, thankfully, that's not descriptive of all the church at all the time. Praise God, it's not. But it is a danger, and we can easily walk the same road as ancient Jerusalem if we're not careful. Jesus saved us not just because he had nothing better to do. Jesus saved us for an active, vibrant relationship with himself. You know, the moment it becomes passive as we take him for granted, that's the moment we open ourselves up to this danger of idolatry. Verse 20, Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your acts a harlotry, a small matter, that you have slain my children and offer them up to them by causing them to pass through the fire? And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. So it gets even worse for Jerusalem. Not only do they worship the other gods with their bodies, but they sacrifice their children to them. And this, of course, is a reference to the pagan practice of sacrificing human babies to the false god of Molech. An abominable ritual repeatedly condemned by God, but unfortunately repeatedly engaged by the people of Israel. So by this point, God's showing that they had completely forgotten the Lord their God. They had completely forgotten where they had come from. They're totally now given over to the pagan practices of their neighbors. You know, the Hebrews, they were supposed to be an influence for good. Instead, they had become influenced for evil. So God goes on to describe more of their sin, verse 23, Then it was so, after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, says the Lord God, that you also built for yourself a shrine and made a very high place for yourself in every street. You built your high places at the head of every road and made your beauty to be abhorred. You offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry. You also committed harlotry with the Egyptians, your fleshly neighbors, and increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me to danger. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you, diminished your allotment, gave you up to the will of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines, who are ashamed of your lewd behavior. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and were still not satisfied. Moreover, you multiplied the acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor, Chaldea, and even then you were not satisfied. So over and over and over again, as God is describing here, God saw that the Jews were influenced by their pagan neighbors. They immersed themselves in idolatry as they built specific places dedicated to false worship. Now think about it, because this is the city of God himself, and they're building places in this city dedicated to the worship of other gods. And as we know from Israel's history, it got even worse than that, because inside the temple they made high places, they put altars of incense, they they actually set up uh, altars to other gods in that temple. Even looking back at Egypt, God had called his people out of Egypt centuries earlier, and now they're going back to Egyptian practices. Finally, God's forced to act in some measure, and he allows the Philistines to come and claim some of these things that God had given Jerusalem, claim them for the Philistines themselves. And you can read about that. It took exactly place during the reign of Jehoram, 2 Chronicles 21. He allowed the, the nation to be troubled by Assyria, though God eventually delivered them in his mercy. But even then, the people didn't learn their lesson. They kept on in their sin, the rumors of their sin extending all the way to Chaldea, which is Babylon. And of course, as we know, that's what attracted Babylon's attention to come in and conquer the land. He says in verse 30, How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. You know, the word for degenerate is very interesting. Amal 
in Hebrew, but it, it literally refers to being hot with a fever, thus being weak and ill. God saying that they were completely sick with sin. They were completely overtaken by their depravity, much like a person with the flu and who is delirious is overtaken with the virus and the disease. Sin makes us sick. It deludes us. It deceives us. We think, you know, in our sin that we're going to prosper, but it only leads us to our destruction. You know, how many times we need to doubt uh, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We're going to still doubt that verse, of course, not before we finally realize that the Bible is true. Sin, that is a sickness of the soul, and as we know, the only cure is found in Jesus. And we need to check ourselves sometimes if we find ourselves engaging in sin more and more. Are we given over in our sickness? Have we become feverish in our lust for those things? If so, we want to throw ourselves upon the mercies of Jesus, asking him to save and to deliver us. That's what he promises to do. Well, to what extent was Jerusalem ruled by her lust? Look at verse 31. You erected your shrine at the head of every road and built your high place in every street. Yet you are not like a harlot because you scorned payment. You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men make payments to all harlots, but you made your payments to all your lovers. Hired them to come to you from all around from your harlotry. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot. and that you gave payment but no payment was given you, therefore you are the opposite. So she's a harlot, but she's worse. She's, you know, at least a prostitute gets paid is what it's saying here. Jerusalem acted like a person so consumed by lust and sin that her idolatry was an addiction. She would gladly pay for the opportunity to commit adultery against God, no longer able to act or to think rationally. The best description we have of this today is like a meth or a crack addict. You know, their very existence revolves around getting their next fixed. doesn't matter what's going on around them. They can let everything go to pot as long as they get their fix. Well, it was the same description here of Jerusalem and their idolatry. At this point, you know, they can't even blame temptation. They go right past that into openly inviting sin. And this is what a lifestyle of sin does to a person. You know, we give way to temptation once. Well, that wasn't so bad, so we do a little more, a little more, a little more. Before too long, you know, a story ends up on the evening news about another pastor or another churchgoer who's fallen into corruption. Sin can blind someone to the point where he or she is consumed by it. We want to be aware of that. We want to keep our hearts humble, keep our eyes on Jesus. And we don't beat temptation by building up our resistance. We find victory by surrender, as long as our surrender is to Christ. So God had given Jerusalem a taste of judgment and discipline in the past. Again, he brought in the Philistines, he brought in the Assyrians. So now he declares he's going to allow them to experience the fullness of his wrath. Look at verse 35. Now then, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your filthiness was poured out and your nakedness uncovered and your harlotry with your lovers, with all your abominable idols, and because the blood of your children with which you gave them, surely therefore I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved, all those you hated, I will gather them from all around against you. I will uncover your nakedness to them, that they may see all your nakedness. And I will judge you as women who break wedlock or shed blood are judged. I will bring blood upon you in fury and jealousy. I will also give you into their hand. They shall throw down your shrines, break down your high places. They shall also strip you of your clothes, take your beautiful jewelry, and leave you naked and bare. They shall also bring up an assembly against you, and they shall stone you with stones and thrust you through with their swords. They shall burn your houses with fire and execute judgments on you in the sight of many women, and I will make you cease playing the harlot, and you shall no longer hire lovers. So Jerusalem would experience the judgment of God. It would be harsh. It would be humiliating. Because she had sought out Gentile neighbors and Gentile gods, then the true God would allow her to be punished by the Gentiles. The city would be judged exactly as an adulterous wife of the time would be judged, because that's exactly what it was. You know, the Bible repeatedly uses the analogy, but even though it does, I think we have a hard time sometimes wrapping our mind around the concept of idolatry being adultery. We have a hard time equating those things. Most of us were to rebel, hopefully, at the, even the thought of committing adultery against our spouse. But when it comes to idolatry, we think of it as maybe a, a lesser sin. 
You know, it's idolatry. That's something everybody engages in now and again. Now, that may be true, but that doesn't make it any less sinful. If sin could be compared, which is questionable in itself, idolatry really would be worse because when people commit adultery, that's a sin against another human. But when we're committing idolatry, that's a sin against Almighty God. Even so, God sees those things as exactly the same, which they are, because a wandering heart is a wandering heart, irrespective of the relationship between husband and wife or being between worshiper and God. It undercuts every other relationship, every other aspect, rather, of our relationship. It erodes the foundation of our relationship. And so it's to be avoided at all costs. So God promised to judge Jerusalem for its spiritual adultery, delivering her over to the Gentiles. But notice, thankfully, it's not going to last forever. Look at verse 42. So I will lay to rest my fury towards you, and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be quiet and be angry no more, because you did not remember the days of your youth, but agitated with me with all these things. Surely I will also recompense your deeds on your own head, says the Lord God. And you shall not commit lewdness in addition to all your abominations. So God's judgment was sincere, but it was also going to be successful. Once his wrath is poured out, it's done. Now he's jealous for his people, but once their attention's on him again, then it's done. His anger would quiet. Question, when does this take place? Well, in part, we see it historically with the return of Jews uh, to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity ends. But ultimately, this is another area where it's going to be fulfilled in the millennium kingdom because that's really when the hearts of Israel are going to be truly turned towards the Lord God in faith. That's going to come up again later in the chapter. Okay, so this is Jerusalem as the unfaithful wife of God. At this point, uh, God's going to continue to detail the sin of Jerusalem, but the picture changes slightly. Okay, this city still pictured as a promiscuous, adulterous woman, but this time is one of three sisters, each of them being unfaithful to the Lord, with Jerusalem being the worst. And it starts with verse 44. Indeed, everyone who quotes Proverbs will use this proverb against you, like mother, like daughter. You are your mother's daughter, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters who loathe their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite, your father was an Amorite, your elder sister is Samaria, who dwells with her daughters to the north of you. And your younger sister, who dwells to the south of you, is Sodom and her daughters. You did not walk in their ways, nor act according to their abominations, but as if that were too little. You became more corrupt than they in all your ways. Now, we know that the sins of Sodom and Samaria are legendary. Sodom is infamous for its destruction, where Samaria started out, we know, as a people of God. They fell into total disarray and basically lost its identity as God's people. Here, God lists them as sisters with Jerusalem. And as with Jerusalem, both Sodom and Samaria had pagan beginnings. They lived out their days in idolatrous sin. Yet Jerusalem, God says, went on to even greater sins. As God spoke of her, you became more corrupt, more corrupt than they in all their ways. Question, how is this even possible? Sodom, that's a poster child for sin and perversion even to this day. How could Jerusalem make the sins of Sodom look small by comparison? Answer, because Jerusalem knew better. Now, Sodom had the general revelation of God in creation, obviously. They even had a single witness of God living among them in the person of Lot. But Jerusalem had what? Jerusalem had the prophets, the kings, the scriptures, the temples, the priests, all kinds of things. And although Sodom couldn't claim complete ignorance, Jerusalem couldn't claim any ignorance at all. They knew the blessings that they had received from God, and they completely rejected God in the process. So their relationship with God had been greater, and that made their sin even worse. And this is one reason it's so tragic anytime you know, a professing Christian gets caught up in a scandal of sin. Why? Because we know better, or at least we're supposed to. Our sin, when we do it, not only demonstrates the sinfulness of all humans, we're sinful humans, period, that's who we are, but it also brings a stain upon the reputation of Christ and his church. And that's why Peter goes on to write, by the way, in 1 Peter 4, 17, I don't have it there, but it, that judgment begins with the house of God. Judgment begins with, it begins with us. Why? Because we have all the more reason to walk rightly because we walk as living witnesses as the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to reflect him rightly. Verse 48, as I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. 
Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. This is interesting because we tend to remember the sin of Sodom as being purely sexual, but it was far more than that. The city was proud, it was selfish, it was oppressing the poor, it allowed them to be exploited. This is in addition to all their other abomination. Which brings up a good point for us. We ought to be very careful by treating sexual sin as being worse than any other sin that's described for us in the Bible. God specifically calls out the pride of Sodom. And under that charge, we're all guilty and just as desperate for forgiveness. Verse 51, Samaria did not commit half your sins, but you multiplied their abominations more than they, and have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. You have judged your sisters, bear your own shame also, because of the sins which you committed were more abominable than theirs, and they are more righteous than you. Yes, be disgraced also, and bear your own shame, because you justified your sisters. Now, God doesn't detail the sins of Samaria like he did of Sodom, History shows terrible idolatry taking place in Samaria. They also engaged in child sacrifice. They engaged in all kinds of evil. Yet again, Jerusalem is shown to be worse because this is the city of God. Well, their actions seemingly justified the sin of her sister cities because after all, if Jerusalem could get away with all their sin, why should not the lesser sins of Sodom and Samaria be excused? Again, Jerusalem was meant by God to be an example to all the rest of the world of what it meant to be in a covenant relationship with God. And yet they treated God as if he didn't exist. So if God did not act, what would that mean for the nations that God did judge? If a judge is just, he's got to punish crime wherever it's found, even when it's found among those that he loves. Justice is what's supposed to be blind. And so all must be treated the same, and that's what he describes here in verse 53. When I bring back their captives, the captives of Sodom and her daughters, and the captives of Samaria and her daughters, then I will also bring back the captives of your captivity among them, that you may bear your own shame and be disgraced by all that you did when you comforted them. When your sisters, Sodom and their daughters, return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters return to their former state, then you and your daughters will return to their former state. For your sister Sodom was not a byword in your mouth. In the days of your pride, before your wickedness was uncovered, it was like the time of the reproach of the daughters of Syria and all those around her and all the daughters of the Philistines who despise you everywhere. In other words, they're going to stay in their captivity for as long as everybody else did. You know, when the Babylonian captivity ended, it didn't end just for the Jews. It ended for all the peoples of the Middle East. Darius allowed all kinds of people to all kinds of nations to return. Even so, we know that, you know, historically speaking, Samaria did not return to the influence it once had. Sodom, we know, is hard to find anywhere in history outside of Genesis. They found the location of the city, but uh, it never did get rebuilt, at least to any size. So when will they be restored to this extent? Uh, this might be a reference, to the, again, to the Millennial Kingdom. The Lord Jesus, we know, will rule over all the earth, but he'll do so from Jerusalem, but that doesn't mean there won't be any other cities in the earth. Apparently, they will have Sodom and Samaria rebuilt. They will be ruled over by God's people. We'll see that in a minute. Verse 58. You have paid for your lewdness and your abomination, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, who despise the oath by breaking the covenant. All sin has a price. Jerusalem paid dearly. They broke this covenant that God made with them in the past. And you know, at this point, it would be very easy for God to have ended the account. They were originally beloved by God, then they betrayed God, and God delivered them over to judgment. And that's it, or should be, but that's not it. God had a wonderful future in store for his people, his favored city. He had dealt with them justly in the past. He's going to deal with them mercifully in the future. Look at how this all ends, starting in verse 60. Nevertheless, isn't that a wonderful word? Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and your younger sisters, for I will give them to you for daughters, but not because of my covenant with you. Would Jerusalem be punished? Yes, it would be. Would they stay punished? No, they would not stay punished. Although Jerusalem had repeatedly forgotten God, God promised to remember, 
he was going to remember his covenant with them. In fact, God promises to go beyond the old covenant and establish what he says, an everlasting covenant with the nation. You might recall Jer Jeremiah prophesying about the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. This is that same new covenant. This is that same new covenant that was officially instituted by Jesus at the time of the Last Supper. This is a covenant that would never end. This is a covenant that would never be broken. And of course, God had been always faithful to Israel. He would remain always faithful to Israel. But in this new covenant, this new relationship, well, what we know is that Israel would always be faithful to God. And we know this is already in action for the church today. We're part of that new covenant. Again, it came in at the, the, the Last Supper. Will it be true for Israel? Yes. When will it be true? Well, most likely it will begin during the days of the Great Tribulation when Israel finally comes to faith in Christ. They see Jesus for who he is, put their faith in him. It's going to continue into the Millennial Kingdom and beyond. And during those years, they're going to be able to look back on their days of rebellion. They'll be ashamed because they'll see them for what they are. But you notice that God is not limited to the terms of his covenant. He can go beyond it in his grace, and he promises to do that with Jerusalem's sisters, talking about people who didn't deserve any grace at all, Sodom and Samaria. And these cities will be given to Jerusalem in grace, just as God referenced earlier on in verse 57. So if the state of Jerusalem's former covenant with God could be characterized as rebellion, as harlotry, and that's what he did for the bulk of chapter 16. How will the state of its future covenant be? Well, that's going to be described as faith. Look at verse 62. And I will establish my covenant with you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. That you may remember and be ashamed. And never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. When I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. So finally, they would know God is their God. And we know, we've seen this before, this is a constant theme throughout the book of Ezekiel. And there are going to be glimpses of faith among the Jews as they see the outpouring of God's discipline. They see God's faithfulness to those covenant promises. But you know, when the fullness of their faith actually comes into play, it comes into play when they experience a renewed covenant, a renewed relationship with God, knowing Jesus Christ as their king. And when they finally see Jesus in faith, then they will finally know the God as the Lord. That covenant keeping I am of Israel. And what will they have in that day? They will have atonement, God says. They'll have peace. They'll have a covering over of their sin. Finally, their sins of the past will remain in the past because why? The blood of Jesus covers it. And as we know, what Jerusalem's promised is what we've already experienced. Our sins are covered, we have atonement with God. Our English word atonement literally comes from at one meant. There's no separation between us because Jesus bridged that separation through his cross and his resurrection. So we praise the Lord. Long chapter, long, long list of sin, just a few glimpses of grace. But you know that long list makes the glimpses of grace even greater. It's like what we've said before, when you're looking at a diamond ring, they set it against this backdrop of, of black velvet for a reason, because it makes that diamond pop. There's a lot more black velvet than there is a diamond, but that diamond shines so much greater. Same thing with here. You get this long list of sin, and then you talk about the atonement, then you talk about this peace, and you talk about this, this everlasting covenant. It makes it so much greater. Did Jerusalem deserve any mercy? Did they deserve a renewed covenant? No. They'd already received mercy, and they despised it. God showed them mercy when he first called them, and they despised it. They sunk lower and lower into sin, completely consumed by it, driven sick, feverish over it. And God rightly promised punishment, and it came. And that should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. God goes up and beyond. He promises grace and renewal and a future. That's our promise. We deserve nothing from God except punishment. We give God no reason to save us whatsoever, but he reaches out through Jesus anyway. That's how much he loves us. That's the diamond that shines on the black velvet. That's the extent of his grace. The darkness of our sin is overwhelmed by the light of God's glorious love. And that's exactly the way it ought to be. If we find ourselves caught up in sin, then we need to sober up. Before we become even more sick and confused, we need to fall on the grace of Jesus. If we start taking the grace of Jesus for granted, again, we need to remember where we came from. Remember the love we've already experienced. Remember the promises that are in the future. 
And to guard us from even getting to that spot, we've got to be renewed totally in amazement of the love of Jesus that he has for us. Keep our eyes on our glorious Savior and see what happens. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for that love, that undeserved love, that unmerited favor. We didn't deserve anything from you, yet you poured it out on us through Jesus. And I do pray, Lord, that you would help us remember. Help us remember from whence we came. The things that you've done. Or guard us from ever taking it from granted. That we would forget your love. That we would forget your grace. And think that it's somehow just part of every day. It's not every day. It's not something we deserved. Keep us in awe of your goodness. Lord, we love you. We do pray for forgiveness, Lord, for where we've fallen short, where we've started taking you for granted. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we can go forward from this place and glorify you. As Peter said, that we would proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.